Well, as David mentioned, we are wrapping up our series on, uh, we've titled Cliché. And a cliché, as you know, is a phrase or an opinion that's often overused or misused that has lost much of its original meaning, maybe all of its original meaning. Tragically, that has happened with some of our most loved passages of Scripture over time. They're quoted a lot, which is a good thing, but at times they get misquoted or they're taken out of context and they get applied, they get applied in ways that they were never intended to mean. We don't ever want to misapply Scripture, ever. It's our hope that we would rather know the intended meaning or the, the truth that was originally given to us through that passage. So in this series, what we've been doing is taking a look at several passages that for a lot of people have become cliches over over time, and we're attempting to reset them the way that they were originally intended. So the, the cliche I want us to look at this morning is one you've probably heard almost everybody, especially if you've been in the church any time at all, and that is this. You've probably heard somebody say, God will never give you more than you can handle. Some of you old school people, more than you can bear, okay? I just, yeah, sorry, Steve. Uh, (laughs) There was one lone voice that shouted, more than you can bear, and that was uh, my good friend, Steve Smith. It... If, you ever hear, if you've ever heard that phrase, you may think that that's actually Scripture. God will never give you more than you can handle. It sounds good. In fact, it sounds almost too good. And that's because it is too good. It's too good to be true. If that were true, life would basically be easy. And if your life is easy, if you assess the sum total of your life to this point as easy, You should tighten your seatbelts because there is a moment coming that's going to change all of that. Life is never easy. If If this cliche were true, we would go right up to the difficulty and then it would stop. That's the way life would be. I remember years ago thinking about that because I would hear people use that as if it were Scripture and I couldn't find it in, in Scripture. And so I started thinking about, is this actually true? And then what God started doing since then is he's been bringing people to my mind who are in situations that are actually far more than a person could ever handle on their own. I hadn't been at Northeast very long when I met this young couple, Jess and Tricia. They were looking for a church, and so we met together and They told me about themselves while I told them about Northeast. And one of the things that they shared during our conversation was that they were expecting their first babies. They were pregnant with twin boys. You talk about how exciting that moment was. I could just see, especially Tricia, just beaming. Maybe that was the glow of pregnancy, I'm not sure, but she was just, she was full of joy. It was not long that they decided this would be their church home while they lived here in central Kentucky. And so they became part of Northeast. But it was just a few months or so later that I got a phone call that Trish was in the hospital. She was having complications with one of the twins. And when I got there, uh, they told me that the doctors had already told them that they had lost one of the boys. She was still pregnant. She, he was still in there, and they were going to try to keep the other brother in there as long as they could. But the next day, I got another call and rushed back to the hospital. She was in labor, and they were trying to stop it, but they couldn't. And so now, what should have been a a euphoric day was one that was filled with just heartbreak that never should be part of somebody's pregnancy. Not only had they lost one son, now their other boy was fighting for his very survival. I can tell you that after a a lot of prayer and God's grace and the team of NICU doctors and nurses at Baptist Health, that little Luke is now an active, thriving elementary boy. He's probably about nine years old today. But when I think of what God doesn't give, that God doesn't give us more than we can handle, I think about people like Jess and Tricia. We're friends on Facebook, and I see those pictures of Luke, but I remember the memorial service for his brother, one of the hardest memorial services I've had to do. If God doesn't 
allow us to have things that are more than we can handle, then why did that happen? Why did that happen? Or why has it happened to millions and millions of other people over the ages, things just like that, or even worse? I'm reminded that a lot of people face a lot of bad stuff, and people will say, why does that happen? And I don't have an answer for it. We live in a fallen world. But some of this stuff seems almost completely unbearable. And some of you know what I'm talking about. I don't know if you know this, but the Bible never says God will never give you more than you can handle. In fact, if we study the Bible long enough, we find it repeating exactly the opposite. That that a high probability that there will be a time in your life where you alone can't handle what you're facing. The giants that you're up against are just too big. Have you ever been there? We assume that this cliche has found its roots, or it has its roots, in a passage in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. If you have your Bible or your smartphone or tablet and you want to turn and follow along, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 10 with verse 11. But I want us to look at verse 13, because that's, uh, that's the verse that people have drafted this, this idea out of. And it says this, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I think where that cliche, God will never give you more than you can handle, it comes from right here. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what your your ability some verses say what you can bear. That's uh, <laughs> it's just for you, Steve. This passage isn't talking about all, the, all of the problems that we face in this life, but he's dialed it in, and what he's talking about specifically here is right there in the very first part of the verse. No temptation has overtaken you. He's talking about temptation. He's not talking about all the challenges, all the problems that we face. He's just talking about the problems of temptation. So this morning what I want us to do is spend a little bit of time and let's reclaim the meaning of this passage and then let's live it out because there's, this is a very rich portion of Scripture and I don't want us to miss what the Apostle Paul has for us. So we're going to dig in and examine this passage and explore that what Paul gives us here are some keys to having success over temptation. So let's back up a couple verses and get a little bit of understanding of what we call context for this, this topic, what Paul is writing about. In verse 11, if we back up, he says this, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Now, what's he talking about? What's Paul talking about, these things that have been written down? Well, in the preceding verses, prior to verse 11, Paul had given several references from the past where the Israelites had given into temptation and sinned. And then there's consequences that came as a result of their sin. As a nation, they had sinned. This is significant sin. This is like a wave of sin. So there's this big temptation and all these people sin and then there's the consequences. And Paul points out that the disciplinary actions that God took because of their sin were to serve as examples for Christian believers. He says these things are examples for us. In fact, Paul emphasizes that these instances that he he spotlights are recorded in Scripture to provide warnings for our benefit as well as the church in Corinth. These examples that Paul cites were written for you and me, not just for the church in Corinth. And they were written for our benefit so that we can, we can have some insight that we don't have to give into temptation, but we can overcome it. So the first of these keys that Paul gives us is simply this. Scripture is given to warn us about temptation. Scripture is given to warn us about temptation. While Scripture clearly has 
tons and tons of purpose for pe the people of God. One of those purposes is to warn us so that we don't continue to make the same mistakes that our spiritual ancestors made years and years ago. Paul builds on that thought later when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, uh, excuse me, 3, 16 and 17. He says this, all scripture, all of it, is God-breathed and used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible, Paul says, is a tool used to equip us for the challenges that we're going to face when we face temptation. The Bible is a key tool for equipping us for this life. It's an essential tool, essential in preparing us to face temptation. Paul reminded the Corinthians that giving in to temptation will lead, will lead them to tragic results. And we all need to be reminded of that truth. Don't ever forget that. Sin never ends well, ever. There's a great line by the philosopher and writer George Santayana, and he said this, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So let's learn from our friends from the past, our spiritual ancestors, if you will. See, Paul knew that if we don't learn from the past, we're destined to repeat it. He knew that we need to remember, and we could learn from the mistakes that they made we don't have to live the same path. This is why Paul so naturally embraces the concept that everything that occurred in past generations and everything recorded in the Bible is meaningful to us as God's people. Here's the reality check. Today's pressures and pace of life make it easy to ignore unintentionally or sometimes just purely forget the lessons of the past. Paul cautions us to remember the lessons that the Israelites learned about God so that we can avoid repeating those same errors. Which brings us to the second key to having success over temptation, and that is the vital aspect of remembering is to study the Bible regularly. You may say, well, that's, that's a similar tune. You you sing to us all the time. And the reason is, is that it's consistent with successful living in our Christian faith. You will find very, very few, and I would say no believers, who have a thriving walk with God who never spend time in the Word. On the converse, people who have a thriving, passionate relationship with Christ are people who spend time in God's Word on a consistent and regular basis. Studying the Bible with consistency so that these lessons from the past remind us of how God wants us to live. We don't need to repeat the same mistakes of those we read about in the Bible. Instead, we should learn from them. And that will come by consistently spending time in the Word. So here's my encouragement to you. Please, if you take only one thing from this message, take the admonition to spend time with God every single day in his word. Well, Paul goes on in verse 12. I love verse 12 because it's small, it's short, but it has a lot of power packed in it. He says this, If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. He's talking about those of us who are spiritually cocky. You know, yeah, I've been walking with God for 35 years. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of one of his mighty men. <sighs> That's a dangerous spot. You should look around. Paul's saying, he's saying, if you think you're standing strong, why are you strong? You're strong because of the power of God. It's not, in, it's not indicative of anything that you have on your own. It's only because the Spirit of God dwells in you. I want you to think about that for a minute. The context that Paul is 
talking about in the preceding verses prior to verse 11 and 12 has to do with idolatry. That's the issue that he was addressing. There was actually idolatry in the church in Corinth. There were people who were Christians, but they were also practicing pagan idolatry. And this, this understanding of what the context was up to this point gives us a lot of insight into what Paul wants to communicate through this verse. This verse is written to persuade the Corinthian believers who continued to practice idolatry that they can have too much confidence thinking they're secure regardless of what they do. That no matter what happens, they made a deal with God and he's got to honor it. Paul's reference here to standing strong when he says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. That standing strong refers to not having a false confidence. And that was something that a number of Corinthian believers had. They were thinking that they could continue to practice immorality and idolatry and never be punished, never be punished by God. There would be no consequences to their behavior. How crazy is that? It's like saying, you and your wife have this understanding. You're married, you're committed to each other, but if you're unfaithful, she'll be fine with it. It's not like that's the predominant relationship in your life. She's still the number one. I don't know any wife who would be okay with that. In fact, I would like to quote one friend of mine. She said, I, I have a lot of problems with divorce, but I don't have a lot of problem with murder, okay? <laughs> so let that cook in there for a while. I, I think she's joking, okay? I think. But there's like a 10%, 15% margin there. I'm not sure. And she's a good friend of my wife's. I'm just walking the straight and narrow here. I just want you to know that. Even though the Christians at Corinth had been baptized, they observed the Lord's Supper on a, on a weekly basis, and they also had this relationship with Jesus Christ, none of these things insulated them from needing to be told, be careful that you don't fall. In fact, none of those things can make it okay to sin. I mean, you can't sin and go, well, yeah, but I took communion last Sunday. I mean, who thinks that? I mean, that's the time to connect with God. It's not like a license to go and do whatever you want. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He's saying, don't get cocky. Pay attention. Be careful that you don't fall. Which brings us to the third key that Paul wants us to know, and that is be alert to temptation. Be alert to temptation. The devil will try to tempt you to sin, so be alert. You think it can't happen to you because you've been walking with God for a long time, but it can happen to anybody. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. King David was considered the greatest of the kings of the nation of Israel. Most people believe that. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 6 through 7, listen to what it says. It says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, he's talking about Goliath here, The women came out from all the towns, all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing. King Saul was the king at the time. With joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. David was this amazing warrior who eventually would follow Saul and become king of Israel. David was seen by the nation of Israel as this amazing, amazing soldier. He had this deep relationship with God. And as a result, God gave David tremendous success. And then one day, for reasons that we're not privileged to know, the great king David let his guard down, tragically. We read in 2 Samuel 11, 1, it says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. The problem here is that last sentence, but David remained in Jerusalem. This was the spring at the time when kings go off to war. This is when kings were with their armies. But he sent his top commander, Joab, instead, and David remained at home. We don't know why. 
Maybe he was tired. Maybe he was depressed. But at a time when David normally would have been with his army, he instead stayed back. And then one evening, he couldn't sleep. So Samuel says he's walking around the roof of his palace, and he's tempted when he sees a young woman who's bathing on her rooftop. That wasn't uncommon in that day. A private place. It was a cool place. Ironically, this young woman was the wife of one of David's most loyal soldiers, one of his mighty men. David was enticed by her beauty, and then he followed through on the temptation by having a one-night stand with her, which through that event she conceived a child. The great King David, who had this incredible relationship with God, let his guard down just for a few moments and then he gave in to that specific temptation. I have said to the staff's, staff's ministry teams that I have worked with over the last 20 plus years that if King David can commit adultery, we better have our guard on all the time. Because this, this is one of those people who had a deep relationship with God. Now, I'm not saying that the enemy isn't throwing the house at David trying to tempt him, that he's working every angle possible. He knows all of his weaknesses. And for that one moment when David was weak, when he let his guard down, boom, they flood, they flood those gates and they come in and David gives in. But if it can happen to King David, none of us should be too cocky or arrogant to think it couldn't happen to us. So be alert to the reality. The enemy will try to tempt you. He's going to try to tempt me. He's going to try to lure us from God and our relationship with him. He's going to try to compromise that and compromise the purposes that God has for our lives. Be alert to temptation. Don't let that happen. Well, as I mentioned, Paul then comes to verse 13, and that's probably where this cliche, God will never give you more than you can handle, comes from. I want to read verse 13 again. It says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow you the temptation to be more. He will not allow the temptation, excuse me, to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure in light of the possibility that the Corinthians could be giving in to sin, Paul wants to remind them that they cannot justifiably excuse themselves from taking responsibility for their own sinful behaviors. Apparently, it was possible that some of them were saying, this is, this is not fair, we're, we're facing too much trial, too much difficulty. See, there's a reason that he says at the beginning is the temptations in your life are not different. He says they're no different from what others experience. The reason he said that is that in the Greco-Roman world at that time, the temptations of, of gross immorality and idolatry and such were commonplace. These weren't special to the church in Rome or Corinth. That's why Paul said the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Everybody faced these temptations. This means that the Corinthians couldn't excuse themselves on the basis that somehow they were under some special attack or some special form of temptation. And it's also true for us. You know, the truth in this text is that we all face the same temptations. Now, some temptations affect men differently than they do women and vice versa, women differently than they do men. But they all seem to affect all of us. We're all tempted in the same way. And this can seem a bit discouraging. And if this is where Paul cut the passage off, it would probably be unfair to leave us in this point of despair. But he goes forward and he says, and God is faithful. And you could spend about 50 hours just reflecting on that simple little phrase that he starts this sentence with. And God is faithful. God is faithful. Never Never, ever forget that. But he doesn't stop there. He goes even further. He says, he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. I believe this is where that cliche came from. God will never give you more 
than you can handle. Yeah, he probably will. He'll probably allow that in your life. He may not be the author of it, but he doesn't shut it off. Some of you have walked down that way. But what he confirms here is the faithfulness of God when we face temptation. He's never going to allow you to face it beyond what you can, which brings us to the fourth key, the last one. God is faithful to help us when we face temptation. The faithfulness of God is seen in the fact that he will support us spiritually and prevent us from being overwhelmed by an unbearable sin, by unbearable temptations. He never is going to allow that to happen. God has set limits on how far Satan can go in when he comes to tempt us. He, God knows what you can handle, and he won't allow us to be tempted beyond that point. Have you ever seen a dog that's on a chain, and you can tell by the circumstances that that dog is there on a normal basis. Maybe this is the place where he gets exercise, or maybe he's there for security purposes, but this dog is, he's big, and he's kind of rough, and he's not an inside-the-house kind of dog, really, and he's, he's got a big old chain, and it's anchored in the ground, and you can tell something about the length of that chain, because if you go the full perimeter of the chain, you'll see the dog has worn out the grass there, right? He runs right to the edge, and then he can't go any further. And he circles around, and he'll wear a path, a complete circle around that anchor where that chain is. That's kind of a picture of what God has done with Satan in your life. He's only allowing him certain latitudes in your life. He has set limits on Satan. He can only go so far to tempt you. Now, it's important to note that this doesn't mean that temptation is going to be easy. It just means that we can handle it with God's help. The reality is that temp temptations will often stretch us, but always remember, always remember, always remember, God will only allow temptations that you can handle. And some of those temptations will be hard. Some will be extremely hard. But take heart. God must know that you can handle it. Otherwise, he wouldn't allow it. That's what Paul's telling us here. So be confident that if you're facing a temptation, it's because God knows that, that with his help you can handle this. Simon, Simon Kistemaker is a, a writer and theologian, scholar. He said, God's faithfulness to his people is perfect even though man's faithfulness to him is imperfect. The reality is that we're going to face temptations and we're going to fight against them, but there are going to be some that we fail. Even King David made his share of mistakes. We may let God down, but God will never fail us. He doesn't un uncouple from us when we sin. And he says, oh, okay, all the deals I've made with you are off. Not only will he not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can handle, but Paul also goes another step further and tells us that as temptations happen, God will always provide an escape. Look at the last part of verse 13 says, when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. He always provides an escape. And the way, the way out which God provides is so that the believer can endure that temptation. He's thought it all out. Any temptation can be resisted if you listen to what Paul has to say because God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can withstand and he'll always provide a means of escape. He'll show you the way out. God will help us to resist temptation. Let me give you five, five ways that he does this. It's not an exclusive list, but I think these are insightful. First, he helps you to recognize the situations and people that will give you trouble. And I, I'm a firm believer that once you identify the trouble spots in your life, it's much easier to avoid them. If you have a peanut allergy, it wouldn't make sense to eat a salted nut roll. Is that fair? That may have tragic consequences. So if you have a problem with alcohol or you have a weakness with drugs or if you have a problem with sexual immorality, you probably shouldn't hang around people that are going to lead you in those directions. You know, if, if you have a problem with gossip, you should, probably shouldn't hang around with people who like to talk about other people. Secondly, he helps you to choose to do only what is right. Right? 
I love the quote by Andy Stanley, there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. If you know what is right, you should do that. You can make a lot of excuses about it, but that's what you should do. And then number three, he will help you to run away from anything you know that is wrong. Paul said to Timothy in his second letter to his protege, he said, flee the evil desires of youth. It's kind of ironic. He's not saying that you're young. He's just saying that there are desires that you've had since you were young, and they may dog you all of your life, but the truth is you should run from them. If this is a problem area for you, don't go toward it. Go away from it. And then God wants us to pray for his help. God, pray for God's help and trust that he will answer your prayers. And then finally, he helps you to seek friends who love God and can offer help when you're tempted. I love what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, He says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad friends, Paul says, will drag you down. Good friends will build you up, spiritually speaking. They're not going to puff you up and make you feel good about yourself just for the sake of making you feel good about yourself, but they're going to, they're going to encourage you. They're going to strengthen you so that you can fight the fight spiritually. We will benefit by hanging out with people who will help us walk with God. And I am so grateful to the people in my life who have done that. There's a number of you in this church, and I just want you to know from my heart to yours, you inspire me, you encourage me, and I'm grateful for that. Let me close with this. God doesn't promise that he'll never give you more than you can handle. In fact, there are times when he opens the floodgates and allows those things to happen. This cliche implies that as a Christian, you'll always be able to handle whatever comes your way. But we know that we will face giants that are too big for us on our own. We know that it's not only, that it's only not by my power, but only by the power of God that we can face those giants down and defeat them. But what God will never allow is for you to face a temptation that you can't have victory over. See, this thing is rigged in our favor. The deck is, stra is stacked against Satan. God promises that you will never be tempted beyond what you can withstand. And he always gives a means of escape so that you can endure. So my friends, let us endure the temptations that come our way. You know, the downside of a message like this is that for many of us, this next week will be fueled with temptation. Because Satan's gonna test and see, what are you made of? Do you really believe that stuff? He's gonna test it, so be prepared. And my hope is this, that you not only will take what Paul has said here and start to apply it to your life, but you'll share it with somebody else who's struggling along the way. I wanna pray for you as you face these temptations and we close, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these promises that you don't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can withstand and you always provide a means of escape. And Lord, we're grateful that you give us these warnings about temptation, that when we're consistently in your word, studying you and listening to your voice through your spirit, you remind us just how we should live and the things that we should turn our backs on and the things that we should pursue and chase after. Lord, help us to always be alert to what the enemy wants to tempt us with, to have our head kind of on a swivel so that spiritually we're paying attention, that we don't let down. God, thank you for not letting us to face the temptations that we can't handle. Thank you for always providing a way for us to escape. Lord, I pray for this body, for myself and for all in this room, all who will hear this message, God, that they would find strength in you. Because I think it's very probable that the enemy is gonna fire at them in some significant ways. Let them not forget that whatever temptation comes their way, you have vetted it. And you, though it may be challenging, may be stretching to them, may, be, may, be, may tax them in some ways, you have made it clear through this passage that we can 
handle this. You're not going to give us more than we can handle. And then, God, help us to look around for that means of escape. Maybe that's a phone call to a friend who can pray with us, or maybe that's just to remove ourselves from a situation, literally to run away and flee the desires of our youth, as Paul said. God, help us to be people who are attentive to this. God, thank you for the truth of this passage, the way it equips us to face the enemy's assaults. And thank you, God, for giving it to us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have never taken that step of faith to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to be ill-equipped to face these challenges that we've been talking about. Because it's only by the power of God at work in our lives through His Spirit that we have this hope that Paul's talking about. And if you're ready to take it or you want to talk more about that, we would love to engage you in that. We're going to sing a song, just a time for reflection. And uh, if you have a need, I'm going to be down front. I'd love to talk to you. Let's stand together and worship the Lord.